Welcome back yet again. At this session, we're going to be listening in on a discussion about four different treatment therapies that are applied to eating disorders. So the E in the, in the title refers to therapies. To have this discussion, uh, we're joined by four experts in each of the areas. Um, we have Professor Glenn Waller, who's going to talk with us about CBTED. Welcome back to Dr. Lassine Wisniewski, who will be talking about DBT. And we have Martin Pradell, who will be talking about FBT, and Stephanie Kanatz Peck, who will be talking about TBTS. Uh, to kick this off, what I'd like to do is, is come to each of the presenters in turn. Glenn, I'm going to start with you, um, but I'd like you to do two things when you um, come on camera and, or you're on camera and unmute. Can you just start off by telling us something about yourselves that's not career related, that uh, the audience probably doesn't know about? For example, I shared with people earlier today that I sang in a choir that got to sing in America. Um, and then for the first round, can you just give us a succinct explanation of what the therapy you're each talking about is, please? So, Glenn, could you unmute, please, and could you lead off with those two questions, please? Gordon, I think we're actually, we haven't managed to get hold of Glenn yet, so maybe okay. someone else and we'll <laughs> see if we can track Moving. him down. Thank you, Adam. Moving right along, uh, Lucene, can we uh, do that with you, please? Could you just tell us something about yourself, maybe something other than the tennis this time? Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, and then a, a, a succinct explanation of DBT. Sure. Uh, so I'm uh, Lucene Wisniewski. I'd say the thing that maybe you know, maybe you don't know if you've ever seen me in a meeting, I'm an avid knitter. Um, so I'm sitting here uh, at home at two in the morning and I have knitting on my lap uh, <laughs> because it helps me to be mindful. And I'm, I'm actually wearing a scarf that I knitted. So uh, those are two things that you might not know, but I tend to have a bit of a reputation of knitting in every uh, meeting I'm in, so you might actually know that about me. I did not know that about you, but thank you for sharing that. Is that one of your <laughs> creations you're wearing? It is. Yes, it is. Thank you for asking. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. So can you talk to us, what's a, help us understand what DBT is? Please? Sure. DBT is uh, short for dialectical behavior therapy. It was a, it's a, uh, third wave cognitive behavioral therapy, which means it has as its base CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy, but it includes um, mindfulness and acceptance based strategies and is was originally designed to treat people with significant emotion dysregulation and suicidality and self harm. Uh, it was developed by a woman named Marsha Linehan in Seattle, Washington. The, the treatment manual came out in the 90s. Um, and it has been adapted for use with eating disorders um, over time. There's several, several different adaptations for eating disorders. But I'd say if you're trying to understand how it might be different than other treatments, um, it, is not, it is a treatment that is predominantly focused on an issue of emotion regulation being the core of uh, the problem. Okay. Emotion regulation is the key to, to DBT, building on the strengths of CBT. Exactly. All right. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Can we move to Martin, please? So Martin, um, first time with us today, is a social worker and family therapist with specialist eating disorder experience in child and adolescent mental health services. He's the current coordinator lead at the Royal Children's Hospital Adolescent Medicine in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, Martin's profile is on the program, on the website, but Martin has done a lot of things about uh, implementing family-based treatment and presenting at workshops uh, and conferences around the country and I think internationally. So Martin, welcome. Uh, could we have your fun fact, please, um, as well as the introduction and explanation of FBT? Thank you, Gordon. It's, um, it's nice to be with you all. We're at the sensible hour, I should say here. Um, but um, uh, if anyone was to come to know me, they would know pretty quickly that I'm a, an avid fan of our national game, um, which is Australian rules football. Some would argue against that perhaps. And in particular here in Melbourne, there's a, a kind of iconic 
large stadium um, that holds around 90,000 to 100,000 spectators. So whenever there's a game of that magnitude, it's, um, it's quite a special moment here in, uh, here in Melbourne and Victoria. Um, so family-based therapy, as most of us would know, is a six to 12 month intensive outpatient treatment for children and adolescents up to the age of 18. And it is considered to be the first line of treatment in many countries that should be offered, particularly for anorexia and increasingly also for, for bulimia. I, I should add, as Anthea has said earlier, that, that there are services and therapists who are adding other interventions in addition to FBT to try and make it more useful and more beneficial for families. Um, the heart and soul of FBT is putting parents at the centre and as leaders of treatment, empowering them with the knowledge, skills and confidence to step in to care and protect their child from the illness and to help the child accept the care of the parents. Now with this comes the journey towards holistic, physical, psychological and social recovery for the child. Uh, the the um, goals uh, are you, yep. Is that, we'll probably get onto those things in a moment. Okay. So you've given us the underpinning uh, description of Great. what FBT is. Thank you so much for that. So moving on to Stephanie Knatspeck, um, and also at a very uh, unfriendly hour of the very early morning speaking to us from San Diego. So it's her first time with us today. Um, Stephanie is the Assistant Clinical Professor in the Department of Psychiat Psychiatry at the University of California, San Diego, which is easily reduced to UCS UCSD. Maybe it's not so easy. She serves as Director of the Intensive Family Treatment Program, which is uh, internationally recognised temperament-based treatment programs for adolescents and young adults and their family members. Stephanie has also been doing a lot of training and presentations uh, and great work in this area, which you, again you can read more about um, on the program. Now, I just want to let people know and declare, I don't think it's a conflict, but it's an interest. Um, EDFA has been working with Stephanie and two of her colleagues, Dr. Christina Weringa and Dr. Laura Hill, uh, to present training seminars, workshops and webinars to clinicians and carers in Australia uh, since early last year. Uh, so there is that relationship in existence. So Stephanie, welcome. Um, and again, we'd love to hear your fun fact. And then can you give us a succinct uh, understanding of what TBTS is, please? Yeah, thank you. I thought I had won the prize for being the most eccentric hour, but then Lucine's over here at 2 a.m., so she definitely wins, um, but I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so um, I'm going to try not to recycle fun facts either, but one of the new hobbies that I've taken up recently is learning how to play the drums. My husband, um, he plays the drums, so he's teaching me. So not something I can show up and do at meetings, but still a fun thing and interesting for my family to listen to me learn. Yes, fun for who, Stephanie, would be my only question. <laughs> um, and, yeah, just to introduce a little bit about TBTS, which stands for Temperament-Based Treatment with Supports, um, which is, you know, the newest treatment probably on the docket tonight and definitely still in testing. Um, but Temperament-Based Treatment with Supports is a treatment for adults with anorexia that was really designed to... Um, approach anorexia from a biological and brain-based perspective. So the treatment focuses on really both explaining and targeting main symptoms of anorexia, such as restriction from a biological basis. Um, the word temperament is in the title because that includes um, temperament and personality traits that we know are predisposed someone or, you know, present as vulnerabilities, as well as neural mechanisms that underlie symptoms. So what we're doing is both educating um, not only individuals with eating disorders, but their loved ones as well, um, and targeting symptoms from, from this perspective. Um, and supports is in the title because we really wanted to um, provide a treatment for adults that included 
support as a primary tenet of the treatment. So, um, and I say support because, you know, I think someone had made a really astute comment earlier on the chat, which is that um, we all need support. We all receive emotional support, social support, sometimes instrumental support, even as adults. And we believe that um, individuals with eating disorders, including adults, should receive and um, help, therapists should help them kind of navigate um, creating a recovery relationship with uh, support one and loved ones in their lives as well. Thank you very much. Um, I just, I've just checked the, uh, the panel on, that I can see. I can't see Glenn having come online yet. Adam, can you just confirm that with me or if I've missed Glenn being there, can you let me know, please? He has not come on yet. Okay, thank you. It wasn't Adam, it was Ginger, but thank you very much indeed. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Um, starting, Stephanie, if you could perhaps lead off in this, what are the factors that make your therapy, TBTS, suitable for the person with the eating disorder yes. and their carers? What, so what yeah. factors should carers be taking into account when considering utilising TBTS? For one thing, um, you know, again, I think all of us are approaching different subsets of the population, but TBTS was designed specifically for adults, meaning um, those individuals with anorexia specifically above the age of 18 um, and on. And, um, and basically they get to, they must attend treatment with a support. A support does not have to be necessarily a family member. It could be any appointed loved one who they receive any level of support one from, and they want to kind of nominate um, for that role. So those are some of the basics. But if someone was looking to um, be interested about TBTS, things to know about it is that, again, we, one of the primary tenets for us is that we believe that anorexia is a brain illness um, and that people don't um, develop anorexia or engage in anorexia because because they're not trying hard enough or because they're resistant to treatment, but rather because there's really powerful biological mechanisms that make uh, restriction easier to do than eating. Um, so, so that would be something that I want people would want people to know in advance that they would be approaching kind of a treatment that's really focused on explaining um, the underlying neurobiology and, and treating from that respect. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Um, Martin, could you give us the same, uh, answer the same question? What are the factors that make your therapy suitable for the person with eating disorder and their carers? I'm talking about FBT, of course. Um, so what, what we do know is that with the evidence over the last three decades, FBT is the first line. So certainly at our service, and this may differ at different services and, and private practitioners, but we would offer FBT to all families that come to our service and you have a diagnosis of anorexia, also atypical and ARFIT at our particular service. Um, and I guess we know the treatment works best when the duration is less than three years. The only exceptions that we would have would be that if there's significant high risk of suicidality that would require an inpatient uh, admission of sort, uh, that there's no parent or carer to do the FBT. Um, so that, that would be the main ones. And, uh, and then the, the other would be is if there's current family violence. And that would be need to be assessed very clearly because uh, FBT would be risky in those settings. So otherwise, without those exceptions, we would say to all families, this is the best treatment that we have. We've been doing it for 12 years. And um, we think we need to offer you this treatment as a first line. At our service, we offer other interventions if we're struggling, but that's how we present it to families and we offer them uh, appointments very soon. In our discharge from hospital, that would be within 24 to 48 hours, first appointment. And if they were coming through our community assessment, that would be within the next week. With, with four appointments in the first two weeks. So we're modelling urgency and we expect and, and uh, of our commitment from the parents in that, in that process. Okay, so what I'm hearing there, Martin, is, is the first line approach with families for um, anorexia nervosa and ARFID. Um, there's a couple of exemptions of when you would do it with a very extreme 
very, very, very extreme risks that are very apparent to you as a clinician. Um, and urgency is a key here. It's about getting the treatment happening with a matter of urgency, not waiting or delaying or seeing what happens. Uh, taking action is what I'm hearing you say there. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yep. Yeah, the, only, the other thing, could you clarify, please? I didn't hear you talk about um, an, an age group or a stage of development of the patient. Is there any guidance around that? Yeah, so the, the treatment is, uh, again, in our service up to 18. I know there are services that have started using it with young adults, but certainly at our service and the, the evidence is up to 18 years of age. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And Lucine, um, the, the same question around for DBT, please. Would you like me to repeat the question? And I think you're muted, Lucine. Mute me? There we go. That's All it. Right. That's what I was trying to say. All right. So DBT is um, a bit more complicated. DBT is not considered a first line treatment. Um, although there are, there are sort of different flavors of DBT that uh, one can consider. And so I'll try to walk through it to, to make sure that you're aware of the possibilities. At the very um, low, uh, let's see, at one end of the continuum is there is a DBT that is an adapted version of the original treatment for suicidality and self-harm that has research behind it for people with binge eating and bulimia. Um, and there's a lovely guided self-help uh, book that was uh, published by Deborah Safer and her group at, Stan at Stanford. Um, and so that DBT, so it's uh, DBT for emotional eating, it's called, is uh, appropriate for people who, and these are um, the, the manual actually, and the research is done mostly for individuals 18 and older who have a significant binge eating or bulimia where um, emotion regulation is at the core of the symptoms. So DBT, again, I'm going to just say is not really the treatment that we would consider first. We would often consider DBT if something, if they've tried one of the more evidence-based treatments and it hasn't been effective. So that's one flavor of DBT. Another flavor of DBT, the, you know, um, I apologize that our, my area is quite complicated, especially with so many acronyms. And so um, DBT in and of itself is a treatment that focuses on emotion regulation, as I said earlier, and in particular on suicidality and self-harm. So if you were to find that your average DBT therapist, they might be and you had a loved one that had suicidality and self-harm and an eating disorder, DBT might be an appropriate um, intervention. But part of the problem is if, you're, if the therapist doesn't also know eating disorders, they're not generally trained to be able to help both the suicidality and self-harm and the eating disorder. So there are some of us who have worked to try, UCSD is another uh, place and my lab and there's a couple others around the world where we've been trying to marry standard eating disorder treatments with DBT for those individuals who either, number one, have suicidality and self-harm on top of their eating disorder or who ha have a complicated clinical picture and haven't been helped by more evidence-based approaches. So, uh, and so in those situations for adults, we take CBT for eating disorders and marry it with DBT. And for adolescents, we take FBT and marry it with DBT. And it's more for those, again, those cases as Martin suggested earlier that might not be appropriate for FBT alone because of some of these other problems. Um, and the way that your the loved ones could could be supportive or help in this is number one, make sure that your individual I'll gets- I'll come back right. to that one. Sorry, Lucene, if you don't mind, I just wanted to just, just to wrap that, that particular question up. Uh, so uh, look, thank you. Yeah, so uh, you've, you've, the last bit there you've covered off already. So DBT can be applied to patients of any age group, but you're looking to deal with the emotion regulation and it depends on the age or development of the patient as to whether you do DBT in conjunction with FBT for children and adolescents um, and you use DBT in conjunction with CBT for adults with uh, eating disorders. Exactly. Okay. Look, thank you. 
Um, look, and I do would like you to move on now, Lucy, to that next question. As carers, if they're engaged with, with, with a, a clinician in DBT, what can carers do to be better equipped to support their loved one with, that, with the therapy modality of DBT? I'd say there's two things that a carer can do. Number one is to help support their loved one for the long haul, because this is a treatment, um, you know, as you might imagine, if in the more complicated version where someone has suicidality and a significant eating disorder, the treatment recommendation is a year long treatment. And so supporting their loved one to continue the treatment to get the entire dose of treatment would be number one. Um, and number two is, um, to learn the DBT skills and the language so that they can, as we talked in our um, session this morning, so that the, uh, the loved ones can manage their own emotion regulation so that they can best help uh, the individual in need. That would be the two okay. things. All right, very succinct. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Stephanie, TBTS, what can the carers, or you would call them support people do, uh, to be better equipped to support their loved one with the therapy? Yeah, well, and that's a good question because that is one of the fundamental um, things that we're working on doing in treatment in TBTS. Um, and I should mention too that we see this as a complementary treatment to other treatments that have more stronger evidence bases behind them at this point. Um, but um, specifically, one of the things that we really focus on is making sure that supports, including families, have the opportunity to hear, just as we as professionals do, about what we know about why symptoms occur, and again, from a brain basis. And what we've found is that when supports are able to get that information, that their ability to support their loved one just increases exponentially. Um, and I sort of liken it to a very basic example. If you have a child crying, you could think of all the reasons in the world they're crying and not know. And if you don't know, your reaction could be 10 different ways. But if you know why they're crying, you can respond directly to that. And similarly, with anorexia, if you have a good, solid understanding of what is happening in the brain um, and why someone is doing what they're doing, intuitively your responses will be better. And that's one of the major focuses of TBTS. Um, yeah. Okay, so so taking the time to understand, the, I don't know you use the word, but understand what's happening in the patient's brain, is that the point so that they, the support person responds more appropriately for where the patient is at? Yes, that's a really good summary, right. And, and part of that too is understanding really um, temperament and personality traits that tend to occur in anorexia and how you can work with someone based on their personality um, and really structure treatment around what works best for them um, and to be able to be more helpful. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and Martin, FBT, what can carers do to be better equipped to support their loved one with FBT? If you come off mute, please. Um, I, think, uh, it's, uh, I think it's already been mentioned earlier on, but if you haven't already, it's very important to access high quality treatment as soon as possible. We know that the quicker access to treatment reduces the duration of the illness and provides a better chance of recovery. Um, educate yourself as Stephanie has highlighted in, in a more detailed way, but educate yourself about adolescent eating disorders and FBT. For some, this can be uh, reading books, uh, checking websites and videos, accessing local international care groups like FEAST to be informed. From our point of view, one of the things that we talk about is being fully committed to the treatment from the get-go. And by that, we put it to parents that in our perspective, kids staying home from school for a period of time, parents taking leave from work, um, allows the system and the family to mobilise themselves around six meals a day and also ends up being 48 meals a week. So that's very, that's essential. And to be able to attend therapy appointments and medical appointments in that way. So that in itself sends a very clear message to the illness that this is urgent and that there's an ex expectation to get going very, very quickly. Um, and then I guess the, the, 
there's a you know there's quite a few points that we put to parents in the early stages but clearly mobilizing your knowledge and skills with the help of the therapist around how much food is enough and being able to supervise the child around every meal in a way that's calm consistent with persistent confidence so that you're able to deal with any distress and suffering that arises in those situations. We certainly talk a lot about parents being unified in their approach um, and that they're also very much working with the care team as collaborators, as consultants. Uh, and also we talk about parents being able to take um, self-care procedures to be able to maintain the intensity and to look after themselves as well as their siblings um, and the other children in the family. And I guess the other thing is that it's, uh, parents need to be aware of um, the personalised sort of recovery process. That it is personalised. That all, not all families are the same in their recovery. There's ups and downs. And uh, it's very important to, to in, in sort of my experience, to be aware and to be able to name what those recovery markers are. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, there's a lot there, isn't it, in FBT for carers to do. One of the things you said that resonated well for me was, uh, was again, this sense of urgency. Um, because many a carer has been very frustrated times seeing a GP trying to get something to happen um, and being sort of felt like they're being put on hold. Come back next week and we'll see how they're going. Um, but it is very much a treatment of where commitment is needed from the carers. Thank you very much. Martin, if you could carry on with the next question. Before proceeding with the therapist applying, in your case, FBT, and for the others on the panel, what your particular modality is, what questions are useful for carers to ask and what answers should carers be listening for from prospective clinicians for their loved one to help them assess whether this clinician is going to be effective in this modality? Yes, there's lots of questions here, Gordon. Uh, but the, the, the ones that stood out for me are that one is if you can ask the therapist, what are the FBT goals and the tasks? Two, will they weigh my child and focus on their eating behaviour? That's critical because that allows you to focus on recovery and progress. Three, what are your expectations of parents in this treatment? Um, and I think this is really important. Who's the FBT care team and what are their roles? Um, and then how it is that you will track my child's recovery and progress. And finally, what will you do if we're not getting, if it is not, if we're not progressing well in FBT? And that's an important question because there are some things that, are, that we've got in our research and in our services internationally where there are things we can do earlier on to maximise success uh, if things aren't progressing. So can you give us examples of answers though? So what are the FBT goals? What sort of answers would an informed clinician? Uh... Well, clearly physical recovery and uh, weight restoration for growth and health. Uh, independent eating, so eating like a normal adolescent as the focus and also returning to adolescent life, which actually includes returning for, to exercise for health and well-being and other aspects of life, such as friendships, education, um, and also family functioning and family relationships. So that would be the goals. The task would be very much centred around, um, in the earlier stages, the role of parents being able to be at every meal and being able to prepare work in a unified way and to make sure that the child's having the food they need to have to one, to stay at a hospital for an inpatient admission, but two, to actually maximise their recovery in wellbeing. Okay. Um, you, the, you said who is the FBT care team? What sort of answer would you be looking from there from a, a I, I, the way I talk about this in, is, is that and, this, and services need to adapt. And if you're working with a public service or a, public ser uh, a private service, I talk about the therapist and the family as the hub. We're in the middle. We're working together. Your therapist is your primary 
um, avenue to ask all the questions and to have all the solutions and the answers. And then the spoke is the doctor to make sure that things are medically safe. The psychiatrist, if things are required in relation to stress management and comorbidities. And then we have the inpatient service as another spoke. If it's required that there needs to be medical resuscitation and uh, a medical stabilisation admission. And at times, and I think this is varied across the world, I'm sure, I think in UK, there's a dietitian who's also involved as part of the spoke. But very essential that the therapists and the parents and the family are in the hub. Okay. Um... Okay, and I get the last question you asked there, what will you do if the child is not progressing? What sort of response would you expect there, Martin? Well, this, this would be kind of cutting edge research and it's more recent research, but I, I, um, we've moved from just uh, providing the FBT, which we did in our RCTs some years ago. We compared the conjoint FBT with the whole family and the separated form of PFT with parents only and the young person seeing a nurse. What we do now is that we maximise the first four weeks. We see that as the critical period. So there's a, there's a marker at four weeks that tells us whether there's progress or not. And in our service uh, in the last four years, we've, been intro we've introduced a one-hour parent support group for all families in the first four weeks so that we're offering some peer support in those first four weeks because we think that's an added change mechanism. And then at that marker, if there's not the progress that we think is, is needed and not meeting that target, we actually offer adaptive FBT, which is currently now being researched in RCT in Stanford and um, in San Francisco. And that adaptive FBT is varied sessions. We, we, we do a parent-only session, we do a family review parent-only session and a repeated family meal. And then we have a uh, step, step process towards the end of treatment, which involves a stream two in our particular service. We've just completed the study um, on, on that uh, approach and looking to, to refine how it is that we can maximise other interventions in addition to standard FB2. Very comprehensive. Thanks very much, Martin. Um, Stephanie, t with TBTS, before proceeding with a TBTS therapist, what questions are useful for carers to ask and what answers should they be listening for? You too, there we go. Yeah, I mean, and I think these are good questions to ask any therapist that you're interviewing, but um, the first one mm -hmm. would be to ask um, a treatment team or a therapist if they can provide their professional perspective on why eating disorders occur. Um, so that you can get a good understanding of what their theoretical orientation is and, you know, what their background is on how they see eating disorders occurring. Um, and often that answer can be really telling because if you have someone say on the phone, well, we believe that, um, you know, it's abuse in the family or something like that, which, you know, those answers still exist out there, um, then you can very quickly filter those people out. We do not believe um, that families cause eating disorders. We believe that they can be part of the treatment treat team and are essential. So, um, so I think that's a really important question. Um, and then the second one... I'd be one, quick to add there, Stephanie, sorry to interrupt you, but I'm sure if we asked the other experts on the panel, I'm sure they would agree with your position on um, that is an informed view about eating disorders. It's not unique to any one modality. Yeah. Thank you. Carry on. Please carry on. Sorry to interrupt. No. Um, and then specifically, I mean, because we're talking about, for, with TBTS, we're talking about treating adults. Um, not that this neurobiological model can't be applied for kids and teens, and we are doing that in our clinic. Um, however, um, really, if you are helping an adult receive treatment and interviewing therapists, we would want to know from the therapist how, if and how they include supports and families in the treatment and in what capacity so that um, people know what to expect. expect. And um, this is, you know, having supports attend treatment formally is a little bit of a deviation from traditional treatment in adults. So that would be a really important question to ask a therapist. And then the last one is how do you track progress, right? We want to make sure that therapists are being guided by um, in individualized evidence, meaning that, you know, there are metrics that can be tracked along um, alongside therapy um, to see how well someone's doing, including weight and other things. And so I would want to know that a therapist is tracking that. 
Okay, thank you very much. Lucene, for DBT, what questions would a carer ask a DBT therapist to see that they're suitable for their loved one? Yeah, so I think the first question, which I think would be most important, is whether or not this particular DBT therapist has experience and is comfortable managing an eating disorder in the context of DBT, because you will find probably many more therapists who have experience with DBT in general, but not necessarily with management of the eating disorder. So that would be an important question to be able to ask that therapist. Now, assuming you have someone who says that they do have DBT experience, I'm sorry, who are, is comfortable managing the eating disorder, because DBT is a, um, has grown in popularity quite a bit over the past 10 years in particular, there are many higher levels of care programs that incorporate DBT strategies as part of their treatment. And so you will hear people tell you that they've received DBT um, already when they might have received some aspect of DBT, but not the entirety of the treatment. And so the research that, um, well, when we talk about research for eating disorders, there's not, there's, uh, you know, almost no randomized controlled trials. Most of the research on DBT for eating disorders for complex and comorbid cases are open trials, not randomized control trials, but we do try to rely on the notion that there is a comprehensive DBT model that we are trying to uh, provide to patients, and that includes four components. That is, the individual therapist has um, significant, significant training in DBT. The, there is a, offered a DBT skills group once a week. Um, where, the, where there is a uh, curriculum of skills that the individual is taught that the uh, loved one who would be receiving DBT has access to their therapist outside of session for what we call skills coaching. So if there is a problem with food or if there is a problem with suicidality or gener what we call generalizing skills, you can learn skills in a classroom but not be able to use them in the real environment because of other barriers, that they would have access to their therapist to get skills coaching in, you know, in real time. And then those therapists that treat this individual are all part of a weekly consultation team where they're meeting to make sure that they are actually providing the treatment the way that it's written to fidelity. And so those four components need to be present if you are looking for a DBT a therapist who's providing DBT in the comprehensive way. Now, I just want to underscore that this is not the same for people who are uh, have a, a milder case of bulimia or binge eating where they might be able to use that uh, guided self-help or individual therapy that was developed at Stanford um, that's a that's a different model. And this is where splitting the hairs around DBT can get a little bit complicated. Uh, but I'm assuming that people who are in this room are more interested for people who might um, have more complicated cases. Okay, look, thank you very much. Look, we're getting lots of questions and we really have, it's a, look, I said to the panel when we had our pre-briefing session that time would go quickly and, and it has proven to be the case, it has gone very quickly. Um, Martin, there's lots of questions for you, um, which are around the theme of how long does it take to recover using FBT? Um, look, I, I know that's, a, well, I'll let, can you provide a succinct answer? Because I know it's not specific, but can see how you go with that. Mm -hmm. uh, are we talking about anorexia here? I will go with that assumption. Right, right. Okay, this is a, this is a not, not an always easy answer and a question to answer for parents. But what I would say to parents is that the, the evidence tells us that it works very well for, for uh, you know, consistently between 35 to 50%. That there's another group where it's partial, that it's not full recovery. Um, and that would be you know, another 30% thereabouts. So it is probably, and certainly my experience is 
there's one in five, 20% where it's no progress with FBT. So from our point of view, we're working harder and we're trying to look at other evidence and hearing Stephanie and Lucene talk today is sort of firing ideas, but it's just this idea that we need to find a way to try and build an intervention first line that's effective with that group. Um, in terms of how long, we say that that the, the, the recovery process is there's remission, and that's the research language, and I won't go into that because that's complicated and it's not the full picture. The full picture of recovery is you get the refeeding, you've got independent eating, and then you have to hold recovery for a period of time to be able to see that the thinking and cognitions are normalised as an adolescent. And for some children, that's very immediate because there's weight restoration, it's physiological. For others, it takes longer and it can take six to 12 months beyond that. And so certainly in my journey, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's tracking that recovery and getting the young person functional in their living in particular. That's a really important, cool, research doesn't look at functionality in terms of going to school, uh, making friendships, um, new friendships, exploring hobbies, actually turning to your parents for care, you know, navigating adolescence, being able to crystallise that towards the end of treatment, in my, in my view, my opinion, that's a very strong protective factor that from a child who's turned away from their parents and taken on the eating disorder as their worldview and their mindset and everything is stuck in that way, to actually end the treatment where you are now beginning to turn to your parents to help you navigate adolescent life, that's a very strong protective factor. And I think um, I see that more often than not that leads to uh, recovery then and down the track. Yeah, thanks for that, Martin. And I think in the lay language, we talk about stage, not weight, um, to that final mm -hmm. point you were making there, uh, which many of us have had, unfortunately had to be around this condition a while, I'll know how vital that is. Uh, look, I'll, I'm gonna put one more question, which I think I'd ask Lucine and Stephanie to start with, and Martin, maybe you can comment after them. Um, and the questioner says, I think it's fantastic FPT has been so successful in treating children and adolescents, but I do feel it relies on parents being reasonably stable and grounded themselves. What if that isn't the case? What if a single parent primary caregiver is mentally unwell themselves or has an undiagnosed DD? Curious to know what the second line option would be in that instance. Um, Lucine, would you like to have a go at that first and would sure. you like me to read it again? No, 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 I got it. You know, this is actually one of the things that I think it w is where uh, we can go back to the research. Um, and we don't actually have any data to suggest that someone who has their own issues, whether it be eating disorder or uh, other mental health issues, means that they can't do FBT. And I would actually still start with FBT um, and uh, until you've been shown that it's not going to be effective. That parent may need some supplemental help uh, managing their emotions or uh, being able to think about how to get extra supports as you would if you were a single parent who is trying to manage a difficult situation like a child with an eating disorder. But I would never assume that be just because someone has those issues, it means they can't do uh, the treatment for their child. Mm. Uh, thank you. Um, Stephanie, your thoughts? Um, yeah, I agree. I think the other thing in TBTS, the reason why we've extended the model to include not just family, but supports is in particular in, adult, in adults. Um, and usually that does end up being in the data that we've collected that has usually actually ended up being a, a family member and namely a parent. Um, however, there have been other types of supports, including friends, um, close colleagues, coaches, things like that as well. Um, and really what this does is kind of broaden the scope of who can come to treatment and provide some level of support, whether it be emotional, instrumental, social, and it will not be, it might not be at the same level that a family member would, but that's another option that we extend in our model is, um, you know, really broadening who the definition of who a support might be. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Martin, is there a comment you want to make on that? Um, we, I, I guess my experience is that uh, we have worked with a lot, um, there's two points there, single parents, we've worked with many single parents and it's been successful 
And so in our public service, I think it's roughly 60% intact, 40% of the single blended family, separated families. There's lots of even intact families that are very difficult to work with and all dynamics that have happened there and intergenerational trauma and all those layers that add to that. The second point in terms of um, undiagnosed eating disorder, that's a very important point. And my preference is actually have it open and to work with it in the room. And um, so rather than it be something that's not talked about, let's actually bring it out and see how it can be a resource because more often than not, it's a bonding experience between the parent and the young person. And two, what it is, how is it it's a constraint? And that often is the case too, because it can reactivate your own experience of any sort of when you're having to refeed your child. So you need to be able to have it open. And so I'm very clear about getting permission from the parent to be able to do that with the child in the room. Okay, thank you. Look, I'd like to finish on, on an optimistic question. So, uh, Lucene, if I can start with you, from the perspective of, of your therapy, in, in your case, DBT, um, or therapies in general, why should carers be optimistic about the recovery of their loved ones? You know, there's uh, people get better. They get better, and even if they don't get better right away, if you that um, I firmly believe that we need to stay... Um, focused on the problems at hand and not give up. And I see people, you know, uh, you know, because what of the treatment that I do, I tend to see people who have not been helped in other treatments, that these are people who have had FBT or had CBT and it hadn't been effective and they need to add something else. And um, the something else does sometimes shake things up enough to be able to help them move forward. But there's, you know, there is reason to have hope. Um, this is a, a difficult illness, I think, for everyone involved. It's really painful, especially as a parent. You know, I've got three kids and I think, you know, what's worse than a parent having to watch their child not be able to eat adequately? It sort of, it sort of goes against your very fiber. Um, but that if you can find your right team and you can find the people who have skills enough to help you, there is absolutely reason to have hope and um, believe that your child or your loved one can have a full life. Thank you. Stephanie, your thoughts on this one, please. Yeah, I think it's really important to remember that we have the great privilege of working with amazing people. So those who develop eating disorders also tend to have amazing personality traits. And, you know, um, the founder of the eating disorder program at UCSD, Walter Cake, coined the kind of the phrase, good traits gone bad. And that, you know, that is sort of what our premise is and um, our treatment is that, you know, people with eating disorders have these amazing traits that mostly really predict success in life. And they've been channeled towards the eating disorder. So these will pe these are people that tend to be a group of people who are going to go on to do amazing things. And just to remember that if we can channel these personality traits in different directions and stay the course, as Lucine said, that um, that we're very privileged to work with and you know um, this population of people. Well, thank you. Look, thank you all. We've had you know tens, dozens of questions come in and we got to about two of them. Um, the number of questions just shows the engagement we had with the people online. And I'm so sorry we, we, had to, we couldn't get to many of the questions at all, uh, but, but, but we've done what we can. Um, look, thank you, each of you, Dr. Lucine Wisniewski, Mr. Martin Pradell, Dr. Stephanie Kanatspec, and a special thanks to Lucine and Stephanie for being up at the hour you are. I wish I looked that good at two o'clock or whatever time it is in the morning where you are because I know I don't. Uh, so thank you very much. We greatly appreciate uh, your preparation and your presentation and comments here today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay.